We are happy that you've come tonight. Usually this would be a time where we're going to tell you a little bit about I mean, then we'll give you an introduction. But let me give you the, the news first, and that is that David, there we go, that David called me last night and said he has sciatica, so he had to cancel. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I was looking forward to hearing David very much, but he's not going to be here tonight, which means you have to endure me and whatever I could do through the day today. So we're, as somebody said, you going to introduce the speaker. I said the speaker needs no introduction. And that's exactly what he's going to get. So tonight we're going to do that in just a few, moment, few moments. I'm going to tell you this for sure. You're going to get out early. I promise. But we would like to take a moment to welcome you if you're a guest today. Uh, I know we have some in, in our midst. Too. It's always good to have you be with us and join us as we, uh, we worship God together and we op open the Word of God together. And we would like to begin tonight before our singing to take a moment to pray together. So we bow. Father, we pray tonight that you would help us to grow closer together and also closer to you. Father, we've been given an opportunity, an opportunity to, uh, to hear your word, to meditate on what you would have us do and be, to help us to consider what our response is to your, your love and your son's blood as we interface with this world. We pray for those who need your help the greatest. We pray for David tonight that he'll be relieved of the sciatica he's suffering from. And we pray that you would keep us through this night as we worship together. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us ancient of days. Come thou incarnate worm, gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless, and give thy word success, Spirit. The highest praise. 
The Kansas City Star is a leading newspaper in the Midwest. It has produced some interesting writers. Its most famous alumnus is a man named Ernest Hemingway, who got his start at the Kansas City Star reporting on minor things. Several years ago, they had a struggle with trying to get journalists to work on the paper as they were going to bigger markets to make more money. And so they put the sign on the side of the building that read, a job with a higher calling. That's a clever way of trying to entice people with something that we all want. Don't you and I want a higher calling? Paul will talk about his calling in Philippians chapter 3. But for us, we go, we're not sure what that is or what it means for us. And yet, each one of us, we want one because we don't like living a life of mediocrity. When you're in your 20s, you ask the question, what will my life be like? And you're searching for identity. And you want that one thing that's going to make your life so special that you'll turn handstands and get out of bed at 4 o'clock in the morning if you have to in order to do it. Most people, once they find it, they realize 4 o'clock in the morning is a terrible burden. If you're in your 40s, though, you begin to ask a different question. Is this all there is? It, now that I've attained what I want to attain, is this it? I was hoping for something more positive, more satisfying, more fulfilling. Then when you get to my age or beyond, you begin to ask another question. Will anybody remember me? All of those are questions about calling. What's, what am I called to be? And yet, at the same time, we find ourselves searching for something that doesn't seem to exist because it's been in front of us the whole time, or it escaped our attention because we've been pursuing something else that we thought it was. So when Paul says, I press on to the high calling of God, does that include you? And if it does, and you know what your calling is, or you find what your calling is, how do you maintain that? How do you keep it going in the right direction? 
That's something that Paul wants to emphasize in the third chapter of Philippians, but also throughout the rest of the New Testament, which he writes. Uh, when we get derailed, we need to get back on, and Paul wants to help us get back on the rails at that point. There is a, that term calling has a strange idea to it, doesn't it? There was a time where preachers would say something about that they got the call of God. Now, that always bothered me. Fred Craddock would say there were, there were people who would come home from college and they would be, decide they wanted to be a missionary in some far-off place. And they said, God has called me there. And the parents are absolutely appalled that they want to go to somewhere in the jungle someplace, far, far away, where they're never going to see them again. And he lamented the fact that it seemed like the call of God never came loud enough for the parents to hear. And yet, we have used the word cavalierly. There was a time where there was a difference between a job and a vocation. A vocation. The word vocation comes from the word vocal. The same word as root as vocal. It describes a call. And so lawyers would have, the, they would have a vocation. They were doing something important. Doctors would be, have a vocation because they were doing something important. And then preachers would have a vocation because they were doing something important. Everybody else had a job, but you had a vocation. You had a calling. And yet today, that's been lost on us as well, as you can see, the term vocational training has nothing to do with the meaning of the words. Do you have a calling? That's an interesting idea. When you ponder it, you go, I don't think I do. But I think you really do. Paul had one. When Paul went to Damascus... He went there to destroy Christians. He was going to take them in bondage, put them in prisons, beat them in Jerusalem, and exact some sort of a, of a confession that would take away their faith. He was going to destroy this newfound Christian sect. But as he went, you know the story of Acts chapter 9, where he Suddenly, he is knocked to the ground by a bright light. There is a voice he hears clearly that no one else can. And now this strong, young, vibrant man, this man on the fast track to become the great rabbi of Judaism, has to be helped to his feet and ushered into, into Damascus, where he spends three days and nights in total darkness. And God said, that's enough. He's learned his lesson. So he sends a man named Ananias, and Ananias says to him, and Ananias says to God, says, I don't think I want to do that. You don't know much about him, do you? I always find that part interesting. Don't you know who he is? Of course he did. He says, you go anyway, because he is a chosen instrument of mine. Paul had this special mission to the Gentiles. He was going to open doors that had been closed for centuries. He would demolish the barriers that culture had erected all time. And there, he was given his calling. And so when we use that, and we look at Paul, said, but I'm not Paul. I never had a voice from God. I never had somebody tell me, I have chosen you especially for this task, I'm just an average church member sitting on a pew on Wednesday night. What makes you think I have a calling? And yet when Paul talks about his calling in Philippians 3, he uses a word that doesn't describe something special, but something that seems to be shot through with every Christian. You think about when he writes the letters to various churches he's visited. He's trying to instill in them the faith that they, perhaps they, they were struggling with. And one of the things he tells them over and over again is about their calling. He tells the Corinthians of all people who are so messed up in their, their theology, so messed up in their practice that you hardly even would recognize them if they were there. He says, for consider your calling. Not many were wise according to worldly standards, were powerful 
or of noble birth. He said, you, God did not have you in His kingdom because you were special. He did it for another reason. They had a calling. He tells the Ephesians to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He tells them they have a calling. All these Ephesians, Gentile and Jew both, to the Thessalonians who are struggling as well. He says, we pray for you that our God may make you worthy of His calling. Now I'll point out something, even though it's obvious. These are regular Christians. Not one of them came out of a baptistry with God whispering in their ear, I have something special for you to do. Instead, they were like you and me, average, struggling, having good days and bad days, baptized into Christ and still growing. But they all had something in common, and we do too if you're a Christian. You have a calling that God has given you because he has washed away your sins, because he has be you have become a child of God. What exactly does that mean? How does, how, do, what, how does we express the calling? When people watch, they'll know. He tells the Galatians, he says, as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He said, you have enrobed yourself with Christ himself. So everything that people see on the outside of you is a mirror of who Jesus is. When they look at you, they see Jesus. That's what happens when you're supposed to be a Christian. It changes who you are to where now your identity is different. Paul would say to the Philippians, in the first chapter of the Philippians, is he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's, having, he's on the horns of a dilemma. He could die any time. They could come in at any moment to wherever he was in the prison and say, your time is up, we're going to execute you today, and he would face a Roman sword. How would you like it if all of a sudden you knew you were going to die in the next five minutes? Would you regret that? There's always this, this word, this, this thought study, I suppose, this thought experiment. If, if I were to ask you this question, would you like to know exactly how and when you were going to die, would you want to know the answer? What would that do to you? See, Paul, he didn't know the when or the why or the how, but he knew it could happen any moment. But he was at peace with that because he said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. If, if I die, I go to heaven. But if I live here, I still get to show Christ to the world. They still get to hear the message and see the message encapsulated in me and what I do and what I say. When I live, I'm living Christ. If I'm dying, I'm dying for gain. But he tells them later in the third chapter, a little earlier than when he talks about his, his calling, he said, his aim is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. He said, when I get to that point, when I'm at that moment where the end comes, I want my life and I want my death and I want everything that I do to mirror everything that Christ did so that when they see me, they'll say, there is Christ himself. The greatest lesson he would ever teach is a lesson born of Christ in him. The truth be told, our calling is to make ourselves as transparent as possible so that people can see Christ when they see us. We can talk a big game. We believe in Christ. People watch. He says he believes in Christ. He says he believes in Jesus. He says he follows Christ. But when I look at him, I don't see anything but him. 
You have obscured Jesus at that moment. So there is this, this, this need of the calling. Say, when our calling is that to, to show the world who Christ is by who we are and what we do. But there are two great truths about our calling. First of all, your calling is who you are, not what you do. It's about your identity. It's easy for us to take what God tells us and catalog it into a, to a convenient catalog of actions that we take. And if we do these right things, we are good Christians. The behavior is okay. The problem is that our will propel the actions if you do it right. After all, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You don't decide what your words are, you change your heart, and your mouth speaks the right things. It's very simple. So whoever you are is what you will show. Does your calling show? But the second great truth is that your circumstances don't change it. We like to think that the only time we can show who Christ is through our lives is when life is good. But what happens when life is bad? See, when Paul writes the book of Philippians, he is in prison. He has put his life on hold, maybe on full stop. We don't know. He doesn't say, You can show Christ when the pressure is off. Basically, our our calling is who we are in all times that that we're in life. When you're sick, you still have the same calling. That better be Jesus' calling. And... uh, The the circumstances of life should not change what we do at all, ever. And so we listen to to what the text says, and it says, for good or for bad, this is what you are. When you got married, if you're married, you stood before a preacher who said something like this. Maybe not exactly the same words. Love, honor, and cherish until death do you part forsaking all others. Something like that. I did have one bride tell me that I'm not supposed to use the term obey her husband in a wedding. I didn't do the wedding. But you hear those those words, forsaking all others. That's the essence of our identity in good or bad, sickness or in health. We are Christ embodied in the church and in the Christian. But that says we can have some problems. You know, when I was a boy, we had a preacher in the town I was in that he had something that I learned at that time preachers should never own. He had a pool table. How he had a pool table, we didn't pay him enough to have a pool table. But I knew why he had a pool table because he didn't preach very well and it was easier to play pool during the week than it was to, to, to prepare for sermons. But I remember being fascinated when I was a boy about a pool table. And the reason was that you could take those balls and a ball could be in a spot and you could roll that ball and it would hit it and it would push it to a different direction. Are you aware that Satan loves to play pool with your life? He loves to get it off of direction. He likes to push it in a different place. He wants to divert it. And he uses all kinds of mechanisms. To do it. It's interesting that what we think is baptism solves the evil problem in our life. No, baptism starts it. Suddenly, he gets to play pool with you and I. He gets to try to rearrange your life and get you off track. And at least for Paul in, in Philippians 3, he says there are two huge issues that will get us off track. In our, in our calling. One is trial. You know, Paul was in plenty of trial. In fact, if he, write, he writes the New Testament, most of his letters in the New Testament to churches that are struggling in some way, that are, have trials. 
But he says in Philippians 3 and verse 2, he said, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. He was very much aware of the, uh, the Jewish teachers who were teaching that circumcision was what God demanded And you needed to be Jewish. You needed to follow the law of Moses. That's what made you a child of God. And so when Paul came into contact with them, they attacked. He was well aware of the danger that he was in. In Acts chapter 14, he goes to Lystra. In Lystra, he just infuriates the teachers. So much so that they have no more arguments left and they're only resorting... Only resort would be to go violent. So they drag him out of the city and they pelt him with stone and they leave him for dead, wiping their hands on the way to get the dust off of him. And there lay the crumpled body of Paul in a road outside of Lystra. But by the grace of God, he begins to move his, his bruised body that must have pained him terribly. And he got back to his feet, and he went back into town. He wasn't going to let the trials stop him from doing his, from fulfilling his calling. And yet, when we face trials, pick one. There are some people who are persecuted physically. We don't, we're not. Our biggest persecution, the people make us feel bad. We feel inadequate. We feel weird. We're made to feel like we're outsiders. We feel rejected. That pales in comparison to laying on a road bruised and beaten. But when those moments come, no matter what they are, they can, they can start talking to us. They can start saying to us, I'm inadequate. I don't do this very well. I'm not a good Christian. And if you start listening to the voices in your head, you're liable to believe them. So Satan comes along and says, I'll give you trial to see if maybe that will do you in. But then he also uses another tactic. He uses a tactic called success. It's exactly the opposite. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus meets a, great, a young man who has a lot of money. He has a great desire to serve God, to be the kind of person God wants him to be. He asks all the right questions. He seems to have all the right motives. He is the kind of person that if you wanted to teach, he's the one who's teachable. The problem is when Jesus teaches him, he can't respond. It's not because he's hurt. It's not because he's poor It's because he's rich. It all got in his way. That's why when Paul talks to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 3, he talks about his successes. He said, let me tell you about what I was. He said, I have reasons for confidence in the flesh. He said, "I, I could feel like I'm okay. He said, I've been circumcised on the eighth day, just as the law said. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as of the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He said, tick them off. I'm successful. And yet what he says was, because of that, I have to forget and let go of those things to become like Christ. What is it that you cherish the most? What is the greatest success in your life that what you want to do is have it and say, this is what makes me who I am? It's anything but the blood of Christ cleansing your heart and your sins and your life. You've got the wrong answer. Because there are so many things that get us off track. I love the story that John Bunyan wrote in 1686 called Pilgrim's Progress. He has an allegory, and and, and the language is hard for us, but the story is wonderful. It's about a 
a man named Christian who is going to make his way to the great grand city. But on the way, he meets all kinds of characters. There's the character of discouragement. There's one called pliable and another person called obstinate. You met them, haven't you? you you've seen, he, he introduces, they introduce him to danger and to depression. And wherever he goes, he has people tugging on him. And every once in a while, he gets on the wrong road. And as he gets on the wrong road, he finds himself so diverted, he'll never get to the place he wants to go. Finally, he gets back on that narrow way, and he finds his way to the city of Beulah, where he's trying to go in the first place. There's always the danger that we are being told we have to go somewhere else. We have to go this direction. This is going to tug at us. This is going to push at us. And we don't know what's going to happen. So what do you do? How do you keep on the right road of your calling of showing Christ to everybody you know? Well, you have to have a compass. I flirted being a, with being a Boy Scout once. And I say flirted because it lasted about a month and a half. What finally did me in was we were going to have a week-long camp out in the mountains of Glorieta, New Mexico in December. The temperature would be around zero. And the snow would be probably about hip deep. I believe in having fun, but I don't believe in insanity. And so I dropped out of the Boy Scouts. But I did one, learn one valuable skill. That one valuable skill was if you are lost, you need to get a compass and orient yourself so you'll know the direction you're going. If you don't have a compass, you're going to be in trouble. But find a compass, find out where you are, know where it points, and go that direction. Very simple, very basic, but we tend to lose sight of that fact. What's your compass for maintaining your calling? Ask yourself the question, is your calling clear? What is it your life is really about? If someone would say, what are you trying to be as a Christian? What's your one-sentence answer? What's the one thing you can tell them that you have thought through, you have got it clear in your mind, so if you got up in the morning and you had to do things almost unconsciously, you would know what to do? Being a good Christian is not real clear, is it? What does that mean? What is good? Number one, how do you act? How do you respond? What do you do? See, Paul had his down to a fine art. He knew exactly what it was. He said, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And he goes on down and he says that in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but one that comes, or one that comes from the law, but that which through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. You want to ask Paul what his whole calling is? That's it in a nutshell. He's got a sentence, a single sentence, in which he can tell you, this is what my life revolves around. What's your sentence? What do you think it is? How would you explain it to your best friend? How would you explain it to your husband or wife? Because if you can't put it into words, if you haven't thought through it clearly enough, you won't know what you're doing on any given time. So is your mission clear to you, at least, in a way that you know what your identity really is? Secondly, is it supported? The book of Philippians is written in a particular uh, atmosphere. Paul is in prison. He writes the letter to do a couple of things. One is to teach people how to, how to get along in church, stop church fusses. I like the book of Philippians because it's a handbook on church fusses. But the other thing, this is kind of an awkward thank you note. The Philippians have been sending him money. He doesn't need the money. He's appreciative, but he says, I really don't need your money. It's kind of an awkward thank you note. Thank you, but I don't really need it. But he is appreciative because these are people that out of their own distress 
were helping Paul while he was in prison in Caesarea Philippi. And when they couldn't just give him money, they sent one of their own, a man named by, by the name of Epaphroditus, who helps Paul do everything he knows to do, that he needs to do, and he almost dies helping him. Paul says, I've had the support of this church. I've had the support of the people who care about me that I have taught. He never does anything alone. Are you aware of that? Paul never does anything alone. He had a Barnabas, he had a Silas, he had a Timothy. He had the Philippians. He never did anything alone. The calling that he speaks of, the calling that we have to show the world that Jesus Christ is real because we show him to us, cannot be done in the quiet of our own homes. It's done because you know people around you who can help you, who can polish you, who can change you, who can hold you accountable. I love the story that Oliver Wendell Holmes liked to tell. He said there was a king who, every time he would parade himself through town, a little boy would make fun of him. He got really irritated at the little boy. And someone said, well, why don't you just ignore him? He said, because there's something that bothers me about someone always telling me my crown is on backwards. We need somebody to tell us our crown's on backwards. That our life is not what it should be. That could be corrected, that could be changed, that could hold us accountable. So, is your calling supported? But is it durable? Paul wrote letters to make durable Christians who could stand what was going on no matter where they went. In Thessalonica, for instance, they were struggling because Paul was only there three weeks and they had beaten a man named Jason. The house, his house was being used as a meeting place. They didn't even have Paul left. How do you stay in? Paul was grateful they had. He had created durable faith. Durable faith means it can stand the pounding of life and still be okay. There's a commercial that I see on television from time to time. It's, it's a work pants. Now, I like the commercial. The problem is the commercial, it, it's not the best commercial because you don't remember what the product is or the company. Bought a, an ad man who doesn't sell his company first doesn't do a very good job, but I don't have a clue what the company is, but I like the commercial. It's about these work pants, and their point is the work pants are durable. And so they hang them up, and they hit them with a blowtorch, and they don't burn. Then they take them, they beat them with rocks. They don't have holes. Then they go out, and they run a tractor over the top of them three or four times, and they come out just fine. That's the kind of faith God wants us to have. That's the kind of, of calling that we have. Our calling should be durable enough to endure whatever the world throws at it. Now, what that really means for you and me is we, we have to get a little uncomfortable to grow enough to have a durable calling. I'm afraid what we have gotten to in the church today has been that we have, uh, we've gotten too, too comfortable. We want someone to make us comfortable. If you want a durable calling, go do something that's uncomfortable. Volunteer to teach a class. Now, I've known too many people, so I don't teach. They don't have to tell me that. But try it. You know, this past spring, we had some young men who taught the chapel class. And I don't know, I didn't talk to any of them about the outcome of it, but I know one thing. They got a little stronger because of that. More durable. Go talk to someone about your faith in Christ. If nothing else, say, can I share a verse of the Bible with you? That may be the scariest thing in the world to do. Once you do it, you're a little stronger for it. If we want a durable calling, we have to put out the effort to make it stronger and, ex and use what God has given us to make it happen. For you see, our calling 
is never noticed, but people will know what it is by watching how you live. You want the real test of whether or not you're making a difference in the lives of someone? Ask the question, what, if you didn't know I was a Christian, would you guess I am? If you didn't know I followed Christ, would you assume I am? And be prepared for an answer that may not be pleasant. But it will tell you what you need to know. Well, you see, we need to ask the simple question, am I fulfilling the calling that God has given me in a world that needs it so badly? There was a compassionate doctor who went to the jungle to provide medical care to a primitive tribe that was affected by a very contagious disease. And he had medical equipment. He had, uh, he had it all ready for him. He had diagnosed the disease correctly. And he didn't have any needs of, uh, of getting money from the natives, and so he didn't ask for any compensation. All he wanted to do was to treat them and give them the care that they needed. The problem is nobody wanted to take the shots. They didn't want to take the antibiotics that were going to cure their disease. But finally, a few young men decided they couldn't take care of themselves anymore. So they stepped forward to receive the medicine, and they got well. What does the doctor feel at that moment? Joy. And his joy gets even stronger the more the sick come to him for help and healing, because that's the whole reason he came. That's the reason Jesus came, to give you a calling so that they can see him through you. Are you fulfilling your calling tonight? I want to thank Robert tonight for helping us uh, and challenging us to explore our calling. Each and every one of us have one, and he did an excellent job of really, I uh, think, pinpointing that in our lives. Robert always amazes me. Many times he's been called at the last minute to make it happen, and he did a great job of making it happen tonight, and uh, we really appreciate him very much. Let's pray. Almighty God, we're so very grateful for this day. We thank you so much, O oh Lord, for this congregation of your people. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the fact that uh, we have one another in you to lean on. We thank you, O oh Lord, for all the blessings you've showered down upon us. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the love that you've shown to us. And we pray, O oh God, that you will help us to explore our calling, O oh Lord. And make that a calling one that is sure. Because we know of the hope that we have in you. We know that the promises that we have in you. And help us to hang on that with our faith and help it to grow each and every day. Please be with us as we leave here tonight and help us to focus on this thought. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.